lions. Yeah, no more lions, I was saying. We've, we've had enough of lions. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so for part two, how we connect the fundamentals of partnership analysis. So um, for this one, I'm just going to be giving you some techniques you can use on your chart. And um, if you, uh, certain programs will actually combine the charts together, or you can open the two charts and just either have them on your phone and go back and forth or have them in two tabs and click between them. And you'll see like if you have half of a channel and the other person has the other half, you, you kind of overlay them. That's, that's the goal. So some programs will do this um, and you can, yeah. So uh, Maya Mechanics does it, or the new Maya app, um, or there's, a, there's an iPhone app, there's different, yeah. but, but if you don't have an app, you can just put your chart and then the other person's chart. And also, I mean, it's a nice way to kind of remember your chart, uh, you start to learn it, and eventually you get to the point where you can just look at someone else's chart and then kind of mentally superimpose yours on theirs and go, oh yeah, well I have gate 12, they have 22, okay, obviously this is how we're connecting in that way. But it's just interesting, um, that was a real uh, breakthrough for me. It was maybe six months in, or when I was first learning human design, I didn't really know about partnership analysis. And um, it was a, a, a breakthrough when I, I realized, wow, you can just take a chart and superimpose it on the other chart, and sometimes they fit like hand and glove. Like Elon Musk and Grimes, they, they each have, you know, he has five centers and she has the other four. And each, so they, their center is just kind of, you know, and, and, and we'll kind of talk about what that means as we get into the themes. But the first thing I want to start with is just the centers and amplification. So if you have a defined center, you're sort of emitting a fixed quality um, from that center. But it's actually the people that have an undefined center that take that in and can seem kind of like the super version of that. Like... Um, you know, 70% of the world is either a generator or a manifesting generator. They have a defined sacral center. That means they have a fixed, consistent way of uh, a resource of energy that's sometimes likened to uh, a gas tank that fills up, that's full every morning, and they have to burn all their gas to the end until they just pass out from exhaustion. And if they can successfully do that, if they can get exhausted enough, then they get the full tank of gas the next day. But if they don't fully use their energy, they're tossing and turning all night and they, they get bad sleep and they actually wake up with less energy the next day. And if they do that enough times, the sacral atrophies and they don't actually have as much energy at all. Well, regardless of that, it's actually in, in the world at large, it's hard to tell who's a generator and who isn't because you need a lot of projectors and manifestors and reflectors and they seem like super generators. And they kind of are, um, f you know, they. <laughs> They don't. Uh, they they might not make it so long before they crash and burn and have some you know fatigue or have some sort of issue, but for that burst of energy, they're amplifying the sacral energy of the people around them and they actually are like a super generator. Same thing if you have an undefined emotional center. Um, I was shocked to find out I have an undefined emotional center when I first got into human design. I thought, well, I'm a really emotional guy. I'm constantly emotional. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling all these emotions. Well, yeah, I was amplifying everyone else's emotions all the time. So they would be here, and I'd be that much higher. And they'd be really down, and I would be that much lower. And I would just be kind of continually taking in others' emotional energy and amplifying it. So one of the first things to realize is just when we're looking at connections, we can start with the very basics of if you have a center that that other person doesn't have, they're going to amplify that. And if they have a center defined that you don't have defined, you're going to amplify that theirs. And it's just being around them. I mean, it's funny, you can have an emotionally defined person, and the emotionally undefined person is crying, or is angry, or is bored, or is excited, or you know, whatever it is, they're kind of expressing the unexpressed emotion of the emotionally defined person. So it gets really, you know, as soon as we get into duality, there's this, this hall of mirrors where you kind of start to realize it's not so simple to know immediately what's coming from where. You know, you see two people and one of them is really emotional, well, they might have the undefined solar plexus. That other one might have a lot of repressed emotion that they haven't let out. And they're kind of triggering the emotion in the one who's more apparently emotional. So that's the first thing to look at. Uh, let me make this, this larger. Uh, oops. Uh, one second. Yeah. So 
Now, the, the other thing you'll notice is that when you combine the two charts, you're going to have a certain amount of centers defined together and a certain amount that will be undefined together. And the first bonding theme we'll start with is when all nine are defined. Now, I only have three centers defined in my own chart, so it's relatively rare for me to have all nine with someone. But Mike, you have uh, seven defined. And there are people who actually have all nine defined. And th therefore, every person they're in a relationship with, they have this bonding theme. Um, but there's also people who have no centers defined, who are reflectors, yet when they come together with another reflector, they make all nine defined because what causes definition is activation of two gates, which are in the same channel. They're the harmonic gates in the channel. And so it's rare, but it actually is conceivable that someone can have no centers defined and yet have all nine with someone else. Because, and we'll get into that in a moment, when they have half the channel and the other has the other half of the channel, it defines both of those centers. That is how definition occurs. Um, so what is this bonding theme? Well, there's these nice, uh-oh, I don't know what these are anyway. Okay. Scary. Amazon Photos. I didn't know, I didn't know what those were. Okay. <laughs> Very scary. I don't know what my Amazon Photos have. I haven't looked at my Amazon Photos. I, that was the curtain. You know, I was a physical <laughs> I'm the man behind the curtain. I just put up a physical curtain there for a moment. Hey, you know, making sure. Okay. So um, the, bonding, the bonding themes, though, nine and zero. So there's these fun little rhymes that Ra made, and he calls it nine and O, oh, nowhere to go. Doesn't doesn't sound great, but uh, it's it's not bad. It's just there's no pressure release valve for this kind of relationship. Um, you know, w when you have openness in the chart, it's it gives you both somewhere to go in the sense that the openness is something where people come and go, or where you can kind of explore changing changing things happening. You know, when you have all nine, it's kind of like when you're with that person. There's, no, there's not really any room for anyone else. Uh, and it can be wonderful. I mean, I have nine and zero with Mike, and we have these great state of human design videos we do, and we have, um, we have great times hanging out. And I mean, it's really a treat to have nine and O with someone because you feel complete with them. But it can also be a limitation in that, um, say you have nine and O, and you're a couple, and then you have a kid. Well, that kid has a really hard time getting in that relationship. I mean, I, I remember a, a friend saying, um, yeah, my parents, and sure enough, they were 9 and 0, they would just talk for hours, they would keep the door closed, and I used to sit outside the door waiting for them. You know, it's like, it's like these relationships where they're so like, locked into each other, there's no room for anyone else. 9 and 0 relationships are the only ones where I'll actually see them whisper to each other while you're trying to talk to them. You're like, hey, what do you guys want? I'm like, I think he's talking to us. <laughs> they're so they're so connected. That they just, so, um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of nice things with the nine and O as well. I mean, there's definitely a feeling of completeness and a self-contained ability to process to do anything. To do, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like you, you know have all, you, all the tools you need to like do anything. Like exactly. it just means that no one else can help you with it <laughs> except for you and your. Exactly, and it can actually be, you know, sometimes, and we'll talk about splits in a minute, splits can be difficult, but it can actually be nice for a 9 no, because the splits are kind of places where other people can get in a little bit. What a split means is when not all of the centers are connected by channels. So you have these centers connected by channels on this side, you have these centers connected by channels, and there's a gap in between. And then, and then people can come along, and they happen to have gates in that gap, or channels in that gap, and they can kind of fit into that somehow. So, um, and splits can be problems, but they also don't have to be a problem. We can talk about that in a moment. So, um, then we have eight and one, and this is what people are always looking for. Eight and one have some fun. Uh, well, why is, it, why is it called that? Well, you have pretty much what you need, but there's one thing missing. Now, if that happens to be um, the solar plexus, that can be difficult. If it happens to be the sacral, that can be difficult. Uh, if it happens to be, I mean, there's a few that it can be difficult. I think Ra said the three hardest, in his opinion, were the solar plexus, the sacral, and the G-sacral. He said that every relationship really needs to have those, or else it's going to have some, some problems. I would add the ego to that as well. Yeah, that's true. I mean, anything that you're missing, and, and if, you have, if you have eight and one with the throat missing, you're automatically split as well. Yeah. And that can be a problem. Uh, that can be 
communication issues. It can be like, well, we need our, our family friend to come by, or our weekly therapist, or our this or that. However, it's, well, what I would just say is when things are missing, or when there's splits, I guess this is a good time to talk about splits. So what is it to have splits? You can have a split in your own chart, which is where you essentially have a gap in between the channels of definition. Uh, you can be triple split or quad split. Or you can be, regardless of what your particular chart is, in a partnership, that can be split. Well, regardless, it's very helpful to have other auras that bridge that split. They have the missing gate, or they have the gates or the channels. Um, and it's, it's actually really helpful to not become dependent on the same person to bridge it the same way. So it's really nice to be able to go to a cafe, and nowadays so many people can do work on their laptops or can write, or just spend time in a cafe and kind of processing because when they're not around those auras and it's not bridging, things will build up. And they build up and build up and build up. And it's like a dam with all the water. And then finally it bursts. In fact, Ra had a nickname for couples who have splits in their chart. He called them fighting in public. Because <laughs> they, uh, well, you know, they hang out for three days and a bunch of stuff happens, but they don't process it. And then as soon as someone comes along with that missing gate, suddenly all the stuff that's built up in this part of the chart and all the stuff built up in that part of the chart can all shoo, connect, and suddenly they have all these epiphanies and realizations. And I can speak from experience. I've had a, a number of relationships that have splits. I had a relationship for a very long time with a split. And it can be difficult because you think everything's okay, and then as soon as it's bridged, it's kind of like, wait a minute, that thing you said last week really did annoy me. You know, I just didn't know it annoyed me until now because it was kind of waiting for, for the digestion process to occur. Um, so there's even a number of people that I see fighting at like concerts. Yeah, because yeah. there's so many people around that it like there's bound to be someone there, and they like you see them come in and they're fine, and then they're like fighting and storming off, and you're like oh. exactly, exactly. They something is something processed is. or digested that they haven't digested before, and it's not settling to their stomach. Yeah. You know, they don't have the stomach for it. So in any case, eight and one is considered um, pretty nice with people. It's nice to have eight and one because basically, you know, and it depends on which center is open, of course, but. You know, say you have eight and one and you have the head center open. Okay, well, you're not going to necessarily inspire each other, but you can both be inspired by the same thing. There's a great quote by the French philosopher um, uh, Badiou. Uh, yeah, Alain Badiou is his name. He said, uh, love is not staring deeply into each other's eyes. It is standing side by side looking out at the world. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different... You know, that's what eight and one is. Nine and zero is staring deep into each other's eyes. You can't see the world because that's all there is. But eight and one is, you know, you're, you're both looking at the same thing. And so you're both looking at what is inspiring. And you can both be inspired together by someone else or something else. Um, but it can also be hard. Say you're eight and one and you have an undefined ego. Well, the undefined ego, this is how we know the value of things. When you don't have a defined ego with someone, it can be very hard to know what value you have for each other. And that's the kind of trope of, I didn't know what I had till I lost it. It took me, you know, years later I realized how important this person was to me and how good that was, and now, you know, now it's too late. You know, so. so, but eight and one, you know, this is one where you have one particular area where if somebody is getting lost in something, at least you both have the same, the same window, so to speak. So it can be difficult if you don't have a solar plexus to find relationship without the solar plexus line. It can also be lovely. I mean, I have a completely open solar plexus, and some of the best relationships of my life have been with people who do not define my solar plexus. It's incredible because it's like, it's so often we get defined solar plexus out in public, then you kind of go back into your private zone with that person, and it's almost like being alone. It's like you're alone together, and that sounds not great, but it is kind of great. You can spend a lot more time together then. There's problems with it. What happens if somebody comes along and they define the solar plexus. Well, they can really easily pull that person away. You know, we, we kind of get pulled into uh, our openness. Seven and two, the, the theme is work to do. And this is difficult because then, do you have a question or? No, that's right. Okay, so seven and two is hard because you have two different things open. These are two different areas. One person can get pulled in one direction, the other can get pulled in the other. You know, so it's kind of like, say you have solar plexus, and you have spleen. Well, one person is getting really pulled into an emotional thing, and they're going through this whole emotional process. 
and the other is sort of the aesthetic thing. And they want to get in a health regimen. They're trying to get excited about their, uh, you know, their health or something. And it's they're very different areas of life, and the, the two different people can get pulled into different areas of life. Um, again, it's not bad. It's just a theme that there's going to be a certain amount of work to do in these relationships to keep it cohesive. And, you know, Ra himself was married for 25 years uh, in a seven two relationship, so it's not that. It's not a bad thing. They're just um, they're just themes, and then six and three better to be free. You know, for most people, this is going to be a very challenging relationship. But what I said about it is this is basically like the sixties ideal. Like this is the open relationship. And by the way, we don't have rhymes beyond six and three, but there's five and four, there's four and five, there's three and six. I mean, um, there's a five and four rhyme. Right? But what's the five and four rhyme? Right? Not a relationship. Anymore. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, it's funny, I did a partnership analysis for a couple where um, normally I don't like to know anything about, you know, I like to do the, these kind of analyses as blind as possible because it's fun to just look at the mechanics and just kind of, and I hadn't looked at the mechanics yet, uh, but she wanted to tell me all about the relationship first. And she said, you know, well, other human sign analysts have said this is a really unconventional relationship. And we are kind of unconventional. Um, you know, we only see each other like a couple times a year, and it's only for like a week at a time. And I was like, yeah, that is pretty unconventional. <laughs> <laughs> you get the rest of the time. But she's like, yeah, but it's a really great relationship. I looked at it, it was a three and six relationship. <laughs> she, had, she had two centers, he had two, and one of them was the same, and they didn't have any electrodes or anything. Wow. And they, they, were, they had six open centers together, so you know. But then, you know, there's actually a zero and nine, which is very happy. It's two reflectors born on the same day, kind of famous in human design land. And um, they're very kind of well known as, uh, as you know, actually one of them is a programmer of, of you know, human design tools and so on. And uh, they were both they're married and had a kid, and they were, um, you know, and, and so that's the other thing is once you've had a kid or multiple children and you you have penta dynamics going on, which will be a, a topic for a different day. Nothing. Nothing more antithetical to Valentine's Day than penta. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> kids. We don't want to hear about having kids. You know, that's, that's when you're making a mistake. But, no, uh, but, uh, but, but it's true, though, that that can, actually, that can actually keep these relationships together. Because if, you, know, you have one kid, two, maybe three, by that time, you probably have all nine centers defined together, regardless. I mean, and, and you have a penta besides that, which doesn't really care. A penta is a three centered thing anyway. Penta is a, a trans auric form that sort of appears, like we have multiple pentas here right now. Um, anytime there's more than two people in a room together, um, this sort of new entity, sort of you know, an invisible swirling vortex of energy appears, and it doesn't really have the same requirements. Two people stuck together put a lot more pressure on each other. Well, there's different pressures for the penta. You know, the penta has material pressures, but when you're with, there's, it's, just, it's just different. Because we have nine centers, so if we're in a relationship that's not activating us in any of our centers, we have six centers open with someone or something, then that means we're going to have all of these dormant parts of ourselves where we just feel like, this person's not really bringing these parts of me to life. I have so much more that when I'm with that other person, all of these things come out. Suddenly we're talking, suddenly we're laughing, suddenly we have solar plexus, and it's sexy and exciting, and we have throats defined, and it's so much communication. And, you know, then I'm with this person who doesn't activate me. But see, it's only really a problem when there are other people around. That's the funny thing. I, my practical advice, if you're in a very open, like in a sense of undefined relationship, like if you have very little definition with somebody, spend time alone together. Because if you don't, if as soon as other people are around, they're gonna pull you away from each other because the person who activates the most centers gets all the attention. So if you have six and three with somebody, someone comes along and they have nine and zero with you, you're gonna spend the whole night with that nine and zero person. And they might have five and four with your partner. Your partner's iced out, you know, they're left out, they're the third wheel. It's an energetic thing. You, you, no, no amount of trying can prevent them from being the third wheel. So it's just kind of at a practical level, if you are in a relationship that has a lot of openness. And I've had six and three relationships, I've had five and four relationships. And for those to work, you just need a lot of alone time together because the moment somebody else, come, or the moment you go out together to a bar, you're both meeting different people and talking to different people all night long. It's energetic. You, you really don't get quality time together. Okay, splits and relationships we mostly covered. Um, the best practical advice here is find places to be private and public. If you have a relationship with a split, go out to dinner, go out to concerts, go out to events where chances are, you know, go out to cafes together where you can sit by other tables 
And just by sitting around other people, you start to get the activation of that other person. Or have dinner parties, have people come over, and they will activate your skills. Just tell them not to worry if you're fighting. Okay, now these are the ways we connect. Electromagnetic connections. So here's the body graph. Say you have a hanging gate. A hanging gate is one where it's just kind of hanging off of the center. In fact, most of our gates are just hanging gates. Well, if somebody else has a hanging gate on the other side of the channel, that's called the harmonic gate, that is an electromagnetic connection. People usually think of these as, wow, I, I love this about them. Well, you can also hate that about them. The exact same thing that you really are excited by can also really annoy you. And it's there, you really can't get away from it. It's a binary. And you know, when you have a lot of electromagnetics with somebody, people go, wow, I have an amazing chart with this person. I have nine electromagnetics. And like, well, it's amazing till it isn't. I mean, it's hard to handle that many electromagnetics. It's kind of nice when you only have one or two. It's nice to have at least one. But there are relationships that have none. I've been in relationships with one. It's interesting to be in a relationship with no electromagnetic connection. That's the spark, the spark we feel with someone. Wow, they really activated me. You know, I have an undefined solar plexus, and they really activated, you know, they made me feel things. It's like, you know, music sounded better, food tasted better, smells smelled better. I mean, and then they left, and it's like this wonderful, animating, you know, a moment of life just walked out the door, and now, I'm, now everything's gray and dull and boring again. That's an electromagnetic. Or just activation in the center. I mean, I have undefined solar plexus, so that's kind of a dramatic example. But uh, it can happen in many ways. I mean, um, you know, that will, that will be a theme of your relationship, that the two of you have an obligation to do whatever that channel is. You have a life force together. Mike and I have 4426. He has 44, I have 26. That's a channel that is about material success. And it's a channel of capitalism. It's a channel of well, of transmitting to the tribe and of creativity, creating new things that we can share with the world. And basically, because we have that, uh, when we hang out, we, we basically need to be doing something in the bigger picture that fulfills that life force energy, and it will go one of two ways. Either we will have tremendous success together, or we'll end up bitter. It's a projected channel. Uh, so, it just as a you know, projector theme is bitterness, if we don't, like, like this, this is something that we collaborated on tonight. Mike is hosting, he's brought out beers and you know different things and he's made it really nice here and provided the space and then I'm doing the, the talk and so on and, and this is a big success. So this is helping our friendship succeed together and be recognized together and uh, doing something creative and so on. We've done many such things, the High Desert Human Design Conference and, uh, and, and, and just various things. Um, our brand. Yeah, exactly. Well, he, he came up with it. High Desert Human Design. He, yeah, I came up with the name of that. And by the way, High Desert Human Design on Instagram. Really, make sure you follow it. Really good account. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, that was my little capitalist show. Channel of Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta show it, you know. Kanye West only has that channel. You know, he's, a, he's just here to transmit creative things he can sell to the tribe. So. But, but in any case, you can see that when you have an electromagnetic to somebody, it puts sort of a new obligation on that relationship. And you can see what your obligations with that person are based on what electromagnetics you have. Uh, those are things that you have to do together. And if you're not able to do them, you're going to end up really angry if it's a manifestor channel. 1222, you know, we have to have good conversations and communication. We have to listen to each other and talk with each other. And if we don't communicate well, we're going to get pissed off. You know, that's just how it's mechanics anger or peace. Um, that's if it's a manifestor channel. If it's a sacral channel, then you're going to end up really frustrated if you can't work with that person and, and kind of reach the satisfaction of that person. If it's a projected channel, which is most channels, you're going to end up with a lot of bitterness. So, so many friendships, 20 years, 30 years, full of bitterness because they've never been able to actually succeed in what those electromagnetics are doing. And so many relationships end up in bitterness because they have five projected you know, electromagnetics and they were not able to succeed. There's no guarantee because you have an electromagnetic that you'll fulfill its obligation. It simply puts the obligation there and it's up to you to figure out how to fulfill it with the two of you together, working together. Now compromise, compromise looks like an electromagnetic. This is where one person has the whole channel and the other has half the channel. 
So you know, say this is somebody's chart, and they have 48, 16, and then you only have 48. Or they have 35, 36, and you only have 36, or, or however it is. I actually, I have 58, so this would be 58, 18. They have the whole channel, I only have half. Now, in the beginning, it looks just like an electromagnetic. It takes time to realize it's not an electromagnetic. Uh, I had a relationship with five compromises and no electromagnetics. Talk about a not self relationship. And the thing is, when we met, it looked like five electromagnetics, <laughs> right? Because we, you know, we were each activating each other in different ways, and, and we're getting these new centers we don't normally have. And the fact of the matter is, you know, um, I have I have gate twenty six as an example. As I was saying, Mike has forty four. That's not. Well, say that there's Mike with his 44, and someone else has 44, and the next person has 44. Then someone has the whole channel, 44, 26. Then the next person has 44. I meet all of them, I just see 44s. I don't see 44, 26. I have 26. It's preventing my ability to see that, they, that, that that's already occupied within them. They're already self-contained. They don't need me to plug into them. They don't have a plug for me to plug into. But it doesn't look like it. Does right. that vary at all, though, if it's like conscious or unconscious? Or? Well, I mean, it varies for them because if it's un—I mean, I guess it varies for me too because yeah. if it's unconscious for me, I'm just going to automatically feel it. I'm not going to necessarily know why. I'm going to be like, I like this one, you know, because they—they they activate. If it's conscious, well, if it's unconscious for them, they might just not even realize that they have it. But I'm still going to see them that way because we still see each other's unconscious gates. It's only really a blind spot for you. That's kind of just, it's kind of funny that way. That we're wearing our unconscious on our sleeves and everyone else gets to see it, but we typically don't see it much ourselves unless we've you know, done a lot of psychological work and so on to kind of see the effects of our unconscious in the world. But what happens with the compromise is, and this is really, if I do partnership analysis for people, I typically start with compromise uh, because it's something that can really get them paying attention. Because they're like, how do you know that? You weren't there. How, how do you know that? That's something that only we know. You know. It's like you're telling them something very private about themselves. Because what you can tell them is basically, like I'll give a, I'll give a simple example. There is a relationship where um, the man had 659, which determines when to be intimate or not. And the woman only had uh, 59. And she was complaining that she would want sex and no. And then other times she wouldn't really be interested and they would have sex anyway. And, you know, or, or she would get, be convinced by it, it would kind of override her. And then, but then when she wanted to, it's like Sunday afternoon, and she's like, my turn, and it's like, no. And he was put up a brick wall, no. And it was so frustrating to her because she couldn't see that, you know, as a 59, she just thought he was a six. And with sixes, you know, there's a lot more of a, we're working on this together, determining together when the right time to be open to intimacy is. Although it is kind of up to the six. But um, in any case, you know, that was something where the only thing you can do with a compromise is surrender. You just have to treat it as if you don't even have that, that gate. You just let them be in charge of that and, and just trust them. And if you can't do that, walk away, right? Because that's really the choice. The choice is not can we collaborate or not. The choice is can I submit or not. There's no collaboration with a compromise. The person that has the whole channel will dominate no matter what. The question is just whether you can put up with them dominating in that way. And if you can, you can stay in the relationship. And if you can't, you walk away. Here's one more example, the 3740, it sets the bargain. Well, there's a guy who had just the 40. His wife has the 3740. His big complaint, married for over 10 years. She works too much, she works long hours, she comes home and doesn't have enough time for me, she's doing stuff with her friend groups, and now she started another group, and I don't get enough time with her and when we do have time alone, well, she sometimes wants to have her own space and she won't even spend time. Well, that's the bargain. Take it or leave it. She sets the bargain. I asked her, do you think that's fair? She says, yeah, it's very fair. He gets to have his time with his people and he gets to do this thing and he gets that and I get to do this. That's the bargain. She determines what's fair. His thing was, it's not fair. It's not fair. Look how hard I work for you. You know, 40, the kind of love gate that works for people to prove how, how much it loves them. And you know, it's look, it's not fair, and it's like he doesn't get to choose if that's fair or not. She does. So anytime you have a compromise, it's so crucial that you just look at the person with the whole channel and say, Can I accept this? Can I submit to this? Can I allow this? Can I allow them to just be the, the sort of arbiter of this area of life? Say you have an individual, you know, 5710, 
there, that 5710 is always going to choose what you're listening to. You put on some music, they change it. They change the radio, or they change it to something else, and they're creating, it's an acoustic channel, you know, they're creating uh, the acoustic environment, right? Or it's, it's just, these are just mechanics, and the mechanics, the compromise is the hardest for the not self because it wants to collaborate, and there is no collaboration. There is only submission. And if you can submit to them, then you can deal with it. Most relationships have compromise. It's just, it's the thorn, it's the pebble in the shoe that never goes away, it's the annoyance. It's, this, is, this is the difficulty. Now, dominance, even though it sounds bad, is actually really easy. That's when one person has the whole channel and the other has nothing there. Nothing easier than that. That's division of labor. It's great to have division of labor. Wow, you just let them do it and you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's so much easier than compromise where you're constantly getting in the way of it doing its thing because you're trying to collaborate and trying to do it together. You know, if I don't have 3740, if I'm in a relationship with someone with 3740, they set the bargain. Easy. I submit to the bargain. Is it fair? I don't know. I don't know what fairness is. I don't think it's fair or unfair. I trust them to know if it's fair or not. You know, if I have half that, then I'm suddenly saying, well, that's not fair. I think I should have a say in what's fair. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I don't, I don't have that life force energy. So dominance is quite easy. And this is also where we really see the other. Uh, when you have dominance channels with someone, that's where they have the whole channel and you have nothing is basically how you would describe them to someone else. Say they have four channels, but you know, two of them you have companionship, which we'll get to next. One you have compromise, and one is dominance, where they have the whole thing and you have none. You'll only tend to describe them as that one dominance channel. That's really how you see them clearly, because that's where you have a wide open window. You have nothing in your chart. You, know, you have an open channel there. You have an unactivated channel, and you can see them very clearly through that channel. The others, you have activations that's getting in the way. And that brings us to the last, which is companionship which is not sexy at all, but it really, really helps. This is when you have, it's actually invisible. This is when you have the same channel as someone else. You know, I have 952. And I'm always surprised when someone else has it because I never guess it ahead of time because it's invisible to me because that's a wall for me on a window. You know, I'm like, oh, you have 952? I never would have guessed. It's like, well, because I am just constantly emitting. That's a channel of stillness, by the way. It's a channel of concentration. Sorry, not that. It's the gate of stillness with the gate of focus. Uh, the channel of concentration, it's called. And so, you know, people see me. Now, if you don't have anything in that channel, if you have neither 9 or 52, you can clearly see me as somebody who has a tremendous amount of focus and a tremendous amount of stillness. I concentrate, right? But if you have that channel, you just see me as another person. Or if you have half of that channel, you see me as somebody we can collaborate together on focusing on something, then you're like Mike, you know, maybe disappointed sometimes. You've done a great job of not, uh, not getting to frustrated with me that I get to choose what we're focusing on. And I get to choose, you know, kind of w w what to pay attention to. And you're like, well, what about this? And I'm like, I'm not paying attention. You know, so, but you do a really good job of that. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, good work. Yeah. Make sure to follow High Desert Human Design on Instagram. Stay up to date with human design events in the area, um, <laughs> as well as memes. And uh, Human Design Catalyst occurs weekly, Monday nights, 6 to 8 p.m. here. Thank you. 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 Thank